Thanks, Craig. Morning, everybody. Merry Christmas. Thanks so much. Wow. I love Christmas time. Um, my family loves Christmas time, actually. But before we get to that, I just want to thank some people this morning for a tireless effort in making days like today possible. Some people arrived here at 6.30 this morning while we were opening presents or doing whatever we were doing. They were here working. Um, and those that have been here before 7 a.m. this morning, would you please stand? So it's the musos, it's the, the guys that help at the back. Stand, come on, proudly. Can we just give them a huge hand? Thank you so much. Just so grateful for the servant-heartedness of, of so many of you. Christmas is an awesome time, isn't it? It's just festive. It's fun in our household. So we got three kids. For those of you who don't know us, my name, my name is Guy. Um, I know Craig did mention that, but just to, just to introduce myself personally, and my wife Cheryl, and we have three children. Our oldest is in America or pairing in, um, in Tennessee, and our son Ryan schools in KZN. He's actually with a friend um, in the Eastern Cape at the moment, having a bit of a, of a holiday at R Reach River, and then Gracie's with us. And Christmas in our household is fun. In fact, Gracie, Gracie absolutely loves Christmas. She, she's our 14-year-old. On the 1st of December, that's when it starts. We have to put decorations up. E even before the 1st, we start getting ready so that on the 1st, it's the decorations, it's a big meal, and it's watching a Christmas movie. That's how it is in our home. And then everything from the 1st all the way through to the 25th is a build-up to today. It's the gifts, it's the meals, it's the... In fact, we had probably 14 or 15 people in our home last night. And um, we, we stay in a nice, cozy little home at the moment, little two-bedroom place. And it was packed, but just awesome. You know, we spent the entire day getting ready for last night. This is what I've got to live with, I'm just saying. And uh, Gracie making all sorts of things, some stuff she's never made before, but it's Christmas Eve. And so everything happens on Christmas Eve. Christmas Day today, we're going to friends. Tomorrow, we supposedly are going to, to other friend, to a dam, actually. It's about being together, isn't it? And um, it, let me tell you another little story. When we were growing up, my, my sister is as bad as Grace when it comes to Christmas. She would literally, the night before Christmas, she would sneak to where the gifts were. So the gifts were under the tree. And she would sneak there, she would grab me, you know, and uh, I, I was that high. And she would open her gifts on Christmas Eve because she couldn't wait. So this is kind of something of what I've grown up with. Christmas is fun. And the Christmas story is fun. I love the Christmas story, don't you? The story of the wise man coming and seeing the star coming from a long distance and seeing the star and not understanding what the star was about, but following it, and then arriving at this place where Jesus was born and presenting the gifts. I love those stories. The problem with those stories is we often only pull them out on Christmas Day, or we see them in nativity plays, but they're awesome. And I, I want to, I just want to read a good old Christmas story from the Bible this morning, and then maybe pull some points out of that. It's the story about Mary and Joseph. Guys, you'll know this. The young guys here, kids. It's the story of Mary and Joseph traveling all the way from a little town called Nazareth where Jesus grew up. And they travel because this, um, this big Roman dude called Caesar Augustus, he was, he was the main emperor at the time. And whatever he said, you had to do. And he said to the nation of Israel, he said, I want to do a census. A census is a count. I want to count all the people in this area. And you've got to go to your hometown so that you can be counted and register there. So that's how this story of Mary and Joseph started. They start this track from Nazareth all the way through to Bethlehem. That trip is about 120 kilometers, between 110 and 150, between 70 and 90 miles. It's a long way for a pregnant lady. I mean, she's so pregnant that as she gets to Bethlehem, she has the baby. 
So imagine that walk. Imagine walking 120 kilometers with this baby. And as she arrives there, everything happens. And let's read from there just because we can. So if you are following in your Bibles, or you can follow on the screen, it's from Luke 2. This is the Christmas story. While they were there, that's in Bethlehem, the time came for the baby to be born. And Mary gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room available, no guest room available for them. A manger is a little, it's like a little wooden item. I mean, it can be bigger than that, but it's, it's small. It's, it's a trough where the animals eat from. And she gets these cloths because there was nothing else. I mean, it's a manger. It's, it's full of animal poo. And whatever happens in, a, in, in that environment, it's just normal, which shows the humanness of Jesus. He comes into that environment, and she puts these cloths around him and puts him in a manger. And that's how he comes into the world. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Interesting, we'll see now that an angel comes and talks to the shepherds. Why did God choose shepherds? He chose wise men, follow the star all the way to where Jesus was, but he also chose shepherds. I think it's the rich and the poor. It's those that are esteemed in society and those that aren't necessarily. It doesn't matter where we come from. And the shepherd for me represents the heart of God. A shepherd's heart is one that nurtures and loves. It's the heart of Christ. Verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to them. One angel. Look what one angel appearing does. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Now, they were terrified of God not because He's angry or distant. They were terrified because He's God. And if we had to come into the raw presence of God, it is awesome. It is terrifying in some ways, but it's also really, really special. I mean, imagine having that experience. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid, because I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Great joy. Jesus brings great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's the Messiah, the Lord. This is all coming from an angel to the shepherds. This will be a sign you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with an angel. It goes from one angel to many angels, to shepherds, in the field, watching their sheep on a normal evening. And now it's from one to many, and these angels appear around the shepherds. And they start singing and worshiping and glorifying God, saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom His favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, I mean, that's, quite a, that's just a casual statement, but that's exactly what happened. They were sent from heaven to talk to these shepherds, and then they disappeared again, all on an average, normal night that wasn't so average and normal. The shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. This is the Christmas story. It's so cool. It's so... It's life-changing. The, the appearance of our Savior happened like that. After this long journey from a faraway town, born in a stable, no glamour, just normal. He's normal like us. Also around the Christmas story, an angel appears to Joseph and says, Joseph, I want you to take Mary as your wife. He was grappling through how his wife could be pregnant and they weren't yet married. And the angel explains what had happened, that the Holy Spirit has come upon her and the conception is a heavenly conception. And he says, 
in Matthew 1 verse, um, verse 20, he said, After he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Do you know what Jesus means, the name Jesus? It means he will save people from their sins. Jesus means Savior, one who saves. He actually got another name. He received two names at his birth. Jesus has many names, but at his birth, he actually was given two names. The second name is found in the next verse. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. This is Isaiah that had prophesied this many years before. And this was the prophecy. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. So he's called Jesus, who saves, and now he's called Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? You can read it. God with us. The Christmas story revolves around those two names. Jesus, the one who saves from sin, and Jesus, God who is with us. In a nutshell, Jesus saves so that he can live with us. Isn't that awesome? That's what the Christmas story is about. Jesus saves so that he can be with us and live with us. I want to illustrate this with a little bit of holy chaos. Um, Peter and Jamie aren't here, right? They were here at the first service. Um, I'm going to call some dads to come and help us. If you are a dad with some little kids, I know Jean's in the, in the back room there. Jean, if you can hear me, can you come out with your, with your hordes of kids, please? And any other dads that have kids, just come and help me up on stage, yeah, if you can. I need some help. So if your dads are here, guys, come and join us up here. Yeah, call him. Go get him. <laughs> Ryan, go get your dad. Tell him why is he not coming. Good. Grab his hand and pull him up on the stage. <laughs> we need some more dads. Yo, Theo, come. Jude, where's your dad? Oh, here he is. Go stand by your dad. Yeah. Where's John? So I want to emphasize this man because um, yeah, it takes a while. He, he, yeah, his hands are very full. So this awesome family, just for, for those of us that are part of this church, just some quick family dynamics. This amazing couple live in Malalon. They come to church often from Malalon to White River. And we are planting a home group there in January next year, in fact, early Feb. Isn't that exciting? Are there any other guys from the Malalon, from Malalon who are here this morning? There are a few families that often come through. Yeah. So, um, in many ways, this is a picture of what happens when Jesus comes into your life. It's like, so remember we said Jesus saves so that he can be with us. And it's a beautiful picture. These guys with their dads, if their dads represent God, this is what the gospel is. This is what Christianity is. We saved from sin so that we can be with him. We saved so that he can do life with us. It's beautiful. Ryan, can you come and can I, can I hold you? What? I know you don't mind everyone looking at you. Can you say hello to everyone? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you want to tell them on Christmas Day? Do you want to say anything? Nothing. You're not normally short of words. That's amazing, eh? That's my daddy. That's my sister. That's your sister and that's your dad? Oh, thank you, boy. This is a picture of what life looks like. God saved us from sin so that he can be with us. Thanks, guys. You can take a seat. It's more profound than we think. It's more profound when you think of what we've been saved from, it's profound. And I want to just take a few minutes to tell you about those two names. Jesus saves us from sin so that he can be with us. The, the first section, the saving from sin. What type of sin? A lifestyle of sin. It's impossible to get to God outside of Jesus. 
It's impossible to live a life that is so-called clean, even if you live a clean life but still have no Jesus in you. There's an emptiness inside because that's how you were designed. You and I were designed for this emptiness to be filled, for the void to be filled with Jesus. He saves us from a lifestyle of sin because when we don't know Him, even if we're not necessarily bad people, our nature is sinful and He saves us from that. He saves us from victory over temptation to sin and from addictions to sinful habits. This is such good news to those of you that are battling with addictions. When Jesus comes into your heart and He fills that void, He gives us, he gives us the ability to quit addictions, to move away from addictions, to be free from addictions, we, to be bound to nothing. And even those that are Christians, Sometimes our sinful nature still wants to come up again and those addictions come up even as Christians. I want to say God can help you through those addictions because that's why He came. Save you from sin so that He can be with you. Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus who saves. And then we save from the guilt of sin. I'm sure you would all put your hands up if I asked this question. How many of you have ever felt guilty before? You don't have to put your hand up. But it's all of us. We've all messed up in some way or another. And this baby that was born in the manger and the growth in his 33 years of life and the whole process of the build up to the cross, everything was around this fact that he saves us. And now we don't live in guilt anymore. When I was a new Christian, there were some things I did as a, as a youngster that I really regretted, regretted. I felt awkward about it. I felt shameful about it until I realized this truth. He came to save, and He came to take guilt away. Sometimes, even as Christians, we live in this hole, this trap of guilt, and we battle to move on. We battle to forgive ourselves for what we did 10, 20 years ago. And the reason this baby was born was so that he could grow up and bridge the gap between us and God through the cross. And he's taken that guilt away. It no longer has access in our lives unless you give it access. So that's the first thing that's happened through Jesus' saving, is he saved us from sin. The second thing he saved us from is from this victim mindset. What is a victim mindset? It keeps us down. It keeps us small. It keeps us from growing. It prevents us from moving on. A victim mindset says... It lies to us. It's a, it's, a, it's a great trap of our enemy, the devil. It's this voice that says you can't or you won't or you shouldn't or you won't amount to. You can even be a successful businessman and have this victim mindset. You can be a CEO of a company and do so well and be in, overseeing many, many staff members, employees. And yet when it comes to these things, the issues or matters of God, there's this victim mindset. It's like, I, I, I can't serve him, or I can't lead my family in the ways of God because of what I did. It's a victim mindset. And Jesus saved us from a victim mindset. He's given us now freedom from guilt and shame, freedom from inferiority, freedom from fear and loneliness and sickness. I was thinking this morning, just kind of before we opened our gifts, I, I must tell you something, um, a little confession. Um, my wife's going to kick me for this, but it doesn't matter. Do you know that they missed the first service, Cheryl and Grace, because they were watching a Christmas movie? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Some of you say that. That's, that's really unspiritual. We're actually meant to be on leave at the moment. We actually are on leave. But we've slipped in because we couldn't stay away from you. And so Cheryl said, do you think it's bad for me to miss the first service? I said, no, baby, you're on leave. You're doing what normal families do. So they've already watched a Christmas service, uh, a, a, a Christmas movie, I'm just saying. <laughs> but I was thinking about that. <laughs> Some people are like, that's horrific. No, we're just a normal family like you. <laughs> you come to one service, she came to one. <laughs> This thing of loneliness. Now, for some, Christmas is, is, is not a special time. 
For some, Christmas is a lonely time. And in the light of what we're saying, Jesus came to save us even from loneliness. So some people, when the Christmas season comes around, there's this dread in their hearts. There's this pain because of a crisis that happened or something. I want to say God can give you victory in that place. He can give you this. He, he can allow you to think of Christmas without feeling lonely. And you know when that comes, it comes when we have this perspective that this is not our end stop. This is not our end game, earth. We're going to heaven one day. Eternity is where it starts and it, or ends and starts for us. And I just felt to say that to some of you that dread Christmas. You know, you can trust God to get over that. And I say that with great respect, without under, under, undermining in any way things that have happened. But you can find victory in that area when you start to look through these spectacles of eternity. And then what else has he saved us for? He saved us for purpose. It's like we, we've got a purpose on this earth. It's not just to make it till we're old and hope we do well and have grandchildren. He saved us because he's given us victory over the devil. So we don't have to be afraid of stuff. Some people are afraid of witchcraft that's going on or this, all this demonic stuff that's going on. As Christians, we don't fear that stuff. He saved us for purpose. He saved us to be alive, to serve people around us. It's our privilege to serve. That's why I wanted to make a big thing with those who came early this morning. It's a privilege. It's a, it's a challenge, but it's a privilege to serve. It's our privilege as Christians in the workplace, in the home place, in the marketplace, wherever we are, to serve because we're saved for purpose. And then we're saved to partner with Jesus in seeing a world changed. I couldn't think of waking up morning by morning and having no purpose, eternal purpose. And we have eternal purpose because of Jesus. So that's around his name, um, him saving us. What about the name Emmanuel, God with us? He's with us when we feel afraid, when we feel fearful and lonely. He's with us when we mess up. He's with us when we battle to stay positive. He's with us when we lack confidence, when we feel betrayed, when we get angry. He's with us. He's with us when we lose someone we love. And He's with us when we're battling with our faith. God saved so that He can be with us. Those of you that have been Christians for a long time, today is a celebration. As we go now, most of us are going to friends or family. And even those that aren't, He still saved you for purpose, like I said just now. But those of us that are Christians, this is a celebration. And for those of us that aren't, this is an opportunity to make it a celebration. And in a, a few minutes, I want, to, I want to end this preach by giving you an opportunity to know this man who once was a baby, who came into our world to become like us so that we could now go to God the Father. How do you get to know him? You get to know him by getting to a place in your life where you just realize, I can't do this thing on my own anymore. You get to know him by obeying this prodding, this prompting that you're feeling inside because you will be feeling something because you were born to know him. And unless you know him, there will be, there'll be something that's missing. I remember as a, um, as a young man of 13 years old, I had this friend, I grew up in Peter Maritzburg, and his name was Anton. And he came from a very godly home. And his mom was a, a Christian. In fact, credit to my mom, because she sowed these seeds as a young boy, these seeds of hunger for God. And I, I had this unusual appetite to know God. And um, that came in many ways from the seeds that my mother had sown. And I, I, I would spend a lot of time at my friend's house, Anton's house. And I, I would spend a lot of time with his mom as well, asking questions. 
And she noticed this unusual appetite, this hunger that was growing. And one day she pulled me aside and she said, Guy, would you like to know Jesus, who you talk about so often and who you ask questions about? And I said, yes, I want to know him. And she said, well, it's quite simple. It comes from just simply asking him in. It's like we've got this internal door. There's no handle on the outside. It comes from the inside. There's this unlocking that's required, and we open it up, and we invite him in because he never intrudes. He could, but he's chosen not to. He's given us free will. And I said, I want to know him. I'm ready. And she said, well, there's two options. I can pray with you now and lead you in a very simple prayer, and the prayer will give him access into your heart. Or we can go to church on Sunday night, and after the preach, the pastor is going to give people an opportunity to invite Jesus into their hearts. Which would you prefer? So I said, I'm happy to go to church on Sunday with you. And so that whole week, I was so excited about Sunday night. I went to church waiting to become a Christian, waiting to open this door. And my friend Anton and myself with his mom, we go to church, a church called Maritzburg Christian Center. And I don't know what the pastor said that night. All I wanted to do was respond to this, inviting him in. And the preach finally finished after what seemed like a long time. And he said, is there anyone here who would like to give Jesus their lives to Jesus? And my hand went up so quickly. And I, I forget the process, but it, I found myself up front with a bunch of other people. And I prayed this simple prayer asking Christ to come in. And there were no bells and whistles. My life's been quite, what's the word, babes? Plain. There's been a progressive walk over the years. It hasn't been necessarily one of those. I used to envy those that were on drugs or into Satanism, and they came to Christ, and they had this radical testimony, and it went from here to here, because mine's always been just, just a consistent growth in God over the years. And I gave my heart to him, and nothing much changed that night that I could see. But in a few days, I started to notice the change. That something, it, it's like he cleans you from the inside out. Some people say, well, what must I, once I become a Christian, do I have to give up this and this and this and this? The answer is yes, but you do it in partnership with him. I remember having a chat with a friend in my 20s, so his name was Alan. I said, Alan, aren't you ready to give your heart to Jesus? He said, God, there's, there's too much to give up. I'm not ready. I said to me, actually, don't give up anything. All you give up is your right to your life. And he then leads you, and he tells you what to give up when. He prods. He puts his finger. No one must tell you to give up this or that, because that's, that's control. That's legalism. He's the Father. He's the Savior. He tells you what to do. And you find yourself after a period of time not wanting to sin anymore. I've seen this, rec this, this track record, this pattern in many lives of people who aren't Christians. And it's like God works with them and works with them over the months and the years. And then just before they become Christians, you start to see this change. They start to, they don't know why, but they, they, they feel this this desire to stop doing certain things. No one tells them, but they cut out this and they stop doing that and they're giving up that. And, and I've seen it so often and I'll often whisper to someone close and just say, God's working. Their time is close. It's like He prepares you and then bang, the moment comes and you invite Him in and He changes you in time slowly from the inside out. Some have a dramatic experience, some not. It doesn't matter. And I feel like some of you have been on that journey where you haven't understood it, but something's changed. You wouldn't call yourself a Christian. Maybe you fear God, but you don't know God. Fearing God without knowing Him just puts, it, it just pushes you away from Him. But the fear of God or the love of God makes it a healthy relationship. And it's like something's changing in your hearts and you can't explain it. I can. God's getting you ready to become a follower of Christ.
And I want to ask the question as we get ready to just sing a, one or two more songs and then we'll land. Is there anyone here who you've come to the place in your life and you realize, I need to be saved so that I can have a relationship with him? And I'm not going to call you to the front like I, like I did those many years ago. But I do want to give you an opportunity to respond. And so, would you stand with me, please? It's going to be a simple, um, just a simple invitation. Because you don't need to be buttered up. You don't need to be manipulated to come to Christ. You just got to respond to what's happening in here because he'll be working if you are ready today to become a follower of Jesus to be saved from your sin to hand over your life to him and to start this relationship with him I'm going to ask you it'll be a, ba a, a bold move but just where you are just to acknowledge it put your hand up and down and just say God that's me I want to I want to know this Jesus I want to serve him or perhaps you did know him and you've slipped away and you've got involved in stuff and today you want to come back. Just would you acknowledge it by putting your hand up and down, please? Greatest miracle that could ever happen to you. Okay. I'm going to pray a prayer anyway in case there are some who maybe just didn't have the courage to do that. And if you are ready to pray that prayer, just pray it with me. I'm going to actually ask the whole church to pray this prayer after me and if you're ready to give your life to Jesus just pray it. it's a simple prayer say after me Jesus Christ come let's say it boldly Jesus Christ today I want to serve you for the rest of my life I need to be saved and I desperately need a relationship with you I was born to have a relationship with you. And today I want to discover that, Lord. And Lord, I'm full of sin. We all are. But you today have offered to take my sin away. Forgive me for my sin, Lord. My life of sin. I give you my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. That's awesome. <laughs> Amen. If you prayed that prayer, go tell someone. Like, be bold. Go tell someone. It's a good thing to tell someone soon so that you don't become what we call a closet Christian. That Christian who's shy about their faith. Go tell someone. Because he's worth telling people about. And your life will change. God bless you. Have an awesome day. I'm going to hand over to you, Craig.